So this talk has two kind of main parts. Um, the first part is just torch basics, so just using torch for doing scientific computing, uh, and an overview of how to train neural networks with torch. And I'll, I'll, I'll kind of stay at a high level um, when discussing that, uh, and then point you to some material if you really want to dive in. And of course, there's the practical session in torch that comes afterwards, if anybody's interested. And in the second half, I'll talk more about automatic differentiation, um, which we've heard a couple uh, talks kind of touch on as back propagation, but I'll go into a little more detail. Uh, and then Torch Autograd, which is Twitter's kind of opinionated implementation of automatic differentiation. And I'll talk a bit more about uh, what's gone into that and what it enables uh, when you kind of take uh, uh, a particular opinion of how you should implement automatic differentiation seriously. Um, so before I get started, who has heard of the language Lua? Okay, it's a good amount. Who has heard of Torch? Probably the same people. Uh, <laughs> and who has used Torch? Okay, so a little bit less. Okay, maybe like a third. Okay, cool. So um, I think some of these details might be interesting to you uh, uh, that haven't used it um, to kind of get a sense of what it's all about. And those that do know it might be just a good refresher. So Torch is a, um, an array programming library for Lua. It looks a lot like MATLAB because it was directly inspired by MATLAB. It just happens to be in a different language with different kinds of trade-offs. Uh, and because it looks like MATLAB, it also looks a lot like NumPy. So if you're familiar with any of these array programming libraries, you'll probably be very comfortable working in Torch and will be able to get up to speed very quickly if it's something that interests you. Um, so Torch is an interactive uh, scientific computing framework in Lua. Um, and this is just like a really quick take on what Lua looks like. It looks very, very similar to Python. So we've got strings like you would want them. You can print stuff. Um, there's only one associative data type in Lua, and that's the table. So you can build lists and dictionaries and sets out of this one data type, but really there's just one kind of single uh, associative data type in Lua. Um, and of course, we've got you know, for loops and all that kind of basic stuff. Um, Torch itself has uh, 150 or so uh, tensor functions. So it's kind of the same level of coverage as MATLAB and NumPy. Um, for doing linear algebra and, of course, convolutions, because Torch has a really strong focus on deep learning, where some of the packages do. Um, tensor manipulation, like reshaping, slicing, everything that you might expect from an array library. Um, and then logical operators for doing masking and stuff like that, and a whole bunch more. Um, and it's all fully documented on GitHub. Uh, and these slides are on the Mila Udem GitHub page. So if you're interested in following along, they're on that summer school project under the Torch directory. Um, the kind of similarities between Torch and MATLAB and NumPy extend um, beyond just the functions that they implement. There's also nice plotting. Uh, everything can be done inside of a, a Jupyter or IPython notebook. So you can do interact, really nice interactive programming uh, with Torch. Um, and uh, you know, just as to run through some quick examples of what kind of common Torch code looks like, uh, here we'll just make an identity matrix. Uh, define a couple scalars, and we can do scalar, you know, tensor math with that. Um, we can take the max and do clamping. I mean, these are all really basic stuff. But if you're comfortable with NumPy or with MATLAB, you should probably be very comfortable with Torch. Kind of getting started should be very easy. Um, we also have Boolean functions, so you can do masking. So you can mask an array and then index into another array. Um, we support all the special functions that you might want, like uh, Bessel and Gamma and all geometric functions like ATAN2. Those come from the Cepheus library. Just as a note, NumPy actually implements these functions by linking into the Cepheus library as well. So we're kind of sharing a common scientific computing code base. Um, and we also have, um, uh, you're able to sample from random distributions. Um, so we've got a whole set of the most common ones you might want to sample from. So here I'm just sampling from a negative binomial, uh, grabbing 10,000 samples, and then you know, using the iTorch plotting functionality to plot a histogram of those values. Right? So again, this should all be very familiar and comfortable to you if you're used to NumPy or, or, or MATLAB. Um, we also have inline help. So you can take a torch function and then prepend a question mark, and it will print out the documentation for that function. So if you're exploring through all these torch functions, it's very easy to see what the call signatures might be. So you can begin to figure out how to use those functions. Um, so Torch is in Lua, which is maybe its most peculiar feature. Uh, and Lua is an interesting language for a couple of reasons. And it's a good choice for machine learning for a couple of reasons. First is that Lua as a language has very little overhead, especially compared to interpreted languages like Python and MATLAB. Um, uh, there's a JIT uh, compiled version of Lua called LuaJIT, 
And if you're familiar with Python, the way you should think about it is PyPy is to CPython as LuaJet is to Lua, if you're familiar with those packages. Um, and in LuaJet, and in to some extent Lua itself, um, for loops are basically free. They're, they happen at C speed. So this is very unusual for an interpreted language for you to kind of turn to writing a for loop before trying to vectorize an operation. Uh, but in LuaJet, and this is part of the NN package, this is code that's like running on uh, you know, large systems and GPUs and in, you know, shipped in the Torch library, there's just a big fat for loop right there. Uh, and there's actually really no speed penalty for doing that. If, you, if you're really a freak about speed, you can drop down into C. Um, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, and the whole language of Lua is about 10,000 lines of C, which is really small for a language. So, and also the, just the features of the language are also kind of minimal. So it's just a very simple, clean language uh, that's um, very fast for an interpreted language. LuaJet's maybe one of the fastest interpreted languages that's out there. Um, and it's really easy also to interoperate with C. And in fact, Lua was designed from the very beginning to interoperate with C. It was designed, first of all, to be a small and simple language, and second of all, to easily be called from C code and make it easy for you to call into C code. There's something called the FFI, or Foreign Function Interface, that's available in LuaJet and Lua that makes calling into C code you know, look like basically plain Lua. So it's very, very easy for you to compile some C code and then begin to use that from Lua. So Lua is really, in practice, this very thin layer on top of a whole ton of C code. Uh, so Torch is a big C and C++, or just a big C library, and Lua is just this thin layer on top of it. Um, so you're very close to the metal. And so integrating with C code, or Fortran code for that matter, um, really doesn't require you to do any Cython or Swig wrapping, which can be sometimes cumbersome to do that kind of gluing in Python. Uh, it's really straightforward. And actually, Lua was originally designed for this purpose. It was originally designed to interoperate with C, and it's used in a lot of places as an embedded language. What that means is there's some really high performance code, and then there's a part where you need to do some scripting. Right? So World of Warcraft, the graphics engine is in presumably C++, but all of the scripting, like when the boss comes out of the cave and all that stuff, that's all done in Lua. And if you're writing macros for World of Warcraft, that's also in Lua. Adobe Lightroom is another program where the heavy lifting, it's like an app for photographers. All the heavy image processing is done in C and C++, but all the UI elements and the glue is done in Lua. Right? And then Redis and Nginx, which are two um, uh, programs for kind of high-performance web programming, uh, they're also implemented in C++, but all the scripting and the kind of the user-facing scriptability is done in Lua. So lots of different applications have chosen to turn to Lua um, to glue together high performance code. And that's kind of what we do a lot of in deep learning, is we have some very efficient implementations of primitive operations, and we want to glue them together somehow, right? Glue a convolution to a matrix multiply, for instance. Um, and Lua was actually originally chosen uh, for Torch because uh, there was a need to do embedded machine learning. So the story that I've heard is Clement Farabe, who is one of the uh, inventors of Torch, was trying to put a convolutional neural net in an FPGA, which is like a reprogrammable circuit board, so that he could have a confident on his bike helmet when he's driving around and identifying objects. And getting that to work in Python is apparently a pain in the butt. I never tried it. Uh, but it was apparently very easy to do that in Lua. So that's kind of the genesis of using Lua and Torch. And now Torch runs in all kinds of places, like on very large server farms at Twitter and on mobile phones. Right? So it can kind of run anywhere. Um, and as I mentioned, there's very easy integration uh, into and from C. Uh, and so this is some production code calling into uh, QDNN. And this Lua code for calling the C function is about as long as if you were to just write it in C. Most of the cruft here is just actually putting the types in the right order and everything. Um, and a really distinguishing feature related to QDNN is that there's strong first class GPU support in Torch. And I think this is a, a really differentiating factor uh, for Torch. Um, you can just require this QTorch library and requires like Lua's import statement for Python. And then all of a sudden you have access to this new type, this CUDA tensor type. And all you have to do is cast your tensors uh, using this member function CUDA. And that tensor has been moved on the, onto the GPU. And then everything you do with that tensor at that point happens as a GPU operation. Right? And the way this works under the hood is we have a whole lot of C implementations for code on the CPU. And then we have a whole lot of CUDA kernels that mirror the functionality of that. And so there's a lot of uh, heavy work on the back end that you never see so that things look very light and transparent. And you can be running on the GPU and maybe not even know it. Um, so it's really, really easy to get your code on the GPU. You just switch types. Um, I personally think that using types to do um, kind of 
multi-device support and multiple dispatch is probably, I, I think that's kind of the lightest and, and most elegant way of dealing with, with multi-device support and, and Torch supports that. And uh, Torch also has a very large community. Um, so there's a, a lot of industrial contributors, but it is not industry owned. All right, and that's a really important distinction, at least for me. Uh, so NVIDIA and Facebook and Twitter all contribute a lot to the open source community, and we use the, these tools internally, but we don't own the direction of this tool. It's community driven. Um, so Facebook AI uses it for, for their research labs, and we use it both for research, but also for production. Right? So all the deep learning that happens at Twitter happens in Torch. Uh, and so that means any image that might get uploaded, uh, to a, torch piece, a piece of Torch code is probably seeing that image. Um, and there's a ton of academic support as well. And another uh, nice aspect of a very large and vibrant community, especially in the deep learning community in Torch, is that as soon as a paper is published with some cool cutting edge result or with some new functionality, uh, there's almost always a GitHub repository that pops up that actually implements that paper. Sometimes the paper comes out at the same time as the GitHub repository. So it's usually the case that you can find working code you can download and run for really cutting edge stuff that might have even come out that day, uh, and, and you're able to run that in Torch. And so there's a whole variety of, um, of networks that are available for you just to download and run or, or modify or integrate into your own project. Um, just a couple examples. Um, there's many different implementations of image captioning that you can download and run. Um, there's also many different implementations of neural style transfer that you can download and run. So there's a lot of different flavors of this that uh, people have just kind of for fun implemented, but also some are reference implementations of, of a publication. Um, there's also a neural conversation model, so you can build a chatbot in Torch by just downloading the code. I and mean, this is all available um, on GitHub already. And then uh, a lot of variants of generative adversarial networks, you can download that code on Torch. So um, where does Torch fit in like the larger scientific computing or data science ecosystem? Um, and it's, it's really clear that you know, Python is kind of the biggest language when it comes to doing scientific computing and doing data analysis and data science defined however you want. Um, and Lua and Torch is much smaller than Python. However, Torch is disproportionately strong for its size in deep learning. Um, and so you'll find a lot of resources for that specifically. And before I learned about Lua, I had been programming Python for about 10 years, and switching to Lua from Python was very smooth, because the languages are very similar, and you can sit down and read the manual for the whole language in like an afternoon. So there's really not a lot to learn there in terms of becoming familiar with the language. So if you're worried about that, uh, you should be able to pick it up very quickly. And in terms of where Torch fits with respect to deep learning libraries specifically, um, the first kind of thing to preface it all with is that there's really no silver bullet library. Um, each library has its strengths and its weaknesses depending on what you want to get out of it. Uh, so if you're really interested in running just convolutional neural networks in production with high throughput, then you should probably pick something like CAFE. Um, but if you want to try weird architectures and do research, you might pick something more like Torch or Theano um, and now TensorFlow, I think, as well. Um, but really, each of these has its strengths and minuses. Um, I think Torch is unique along with TensorFlow in that um, it's mostly used for research, but it, it, we've kind of, at least at Twitter, we've demonstrated that it can be used at scale in production. Uh, so if you're interested in you know, building a startup around Torch and running that on mobile phones or running that uh, on servers, that's something that has been done, and so you can do it as well. Um, and development in Torch in terms of adding new functionality or uh, adding modules to the ecosystem, uh, we have like a core philosophy that I think um, most contributions follow, which is that uh, programming and computing with Torch should be really interactive. You should be able to try things out in an interactive setting to see if things fail very quickly. Um, so that means there should be no compilation time. Right? So this is a choice that Torch makes that uh, we won't be building a compiler um, to uh, run your neural network because we would like to have our computation be interactive. Uh, and also we think that, um, or we prefer the imperative programming style. Right? So that means the torch code should look like torch code and you shouldn't be writing in like a mini domain specific language or something kind of separate. Um, so everything's also very close to the metal. So um, if you are running a given torch function and you're wondering about how it's implemented or you know, why it's slow or fast in a given case, 
if you go to GitHub and look up that function, usually in one or two different hop, one or hops down the code, you can find the C code that's actually running it. So it's actually very easy to introspect what's going on underneath the hood. So if you're that kind of a person, you kind of have a hacker mentality and you want to understand what's really happening, Torch is a really great library for that. Um, and also there's maximal flexibility. So composing different modules together is, is actually pretty easy. So that's kind of a high level overview of um, the Torch core. And um, I think it'd be good just to give an overview for like the, um, the fundamental data types in Torch. You can have a sense of how things are happening on the computer when you're running code. Um, so there's two fundamental data types in Torch. There's a tensor and a storage. Uh, and Torch is unique in that it's decoupled this, whereas in NumPy, it's, it's, um, they're actually fused. So a storage is a linear array of memory that just has a length and a type. So each element is a float or a double or a CUDA float. And a tensor is a view into that storage, right? So a tensor is an n-dimensional view into that storage uh, that is row major in memory. Um, so that means that you access the first row and then you get linear access to the next elements of that row and then you have to skip uh, to the next row. And so this tensor here is a four by six view into uh, the underlying storage with a stride of six by one. It means that as you go down the row, you have to skip six elements in the linear memory in order to go down each row, and you have to skip just one to go across the columns. Um, and Lua, like MATLAB, is one indexed. So if we call the select function, for instance, on this tensor, we're selecting from the first dimension, the rows, the third element, so that green row, and we'll get back a tensor. And what we're getting back, actually, is a view into the storage, right? So tensors are views into storage. So now we have two tensors pointing at the same kind of block of memory. Um, now, if we were to, and also the offset is, is now 13, right? So that's a third property that a tensor uh, can accumulate from a storage. Um, if we were to select from the second dimension, the third index, we'll be grabbing that third column. Uh, now we have a size four tensor uh, with a stride of six. So as we go linearly through this tensor, we need to skip six elements in the underlying storage, right? That's something that, to be aware of if you're trying to make really efficient code. Uh, if you induce a stride, you can slow down some of your operations. So um, how you actually instantiate this practically is uh, we might grab a tensor A from a double tensor that's you know, four by six. At this point, our memory is completely un uninitialized, so there could be anything in there. Um, and then we can fill it with uh, uniform noise. And if we print the result, we've got some values in A that are you know, uniform. Um, and then if we... Uh, select out that third row and call it B and we print that. Um, we've just got that third row uh, in B. And if we fill B with some number like three, recall that this new tensor is just a view on the same piece of storage. So what we've actually done is overwritten the values in A as well, because A is just a view into the underlying storage. So this can be a gotcha sometimes. It's maybe a little bit different from how you think about it in NumPy. Sometimes these uh, slicing uh, operations induce copies in NumPy kind of silently. And in Torch, you really are kind of dealing with the computer's memory uh, uh, kind of closer to the metal. And then as I mentioned before, uh, we have GPU support for all operations. So if you just require QTorch, what you get is this new type shows up in Torch, this CUDA tensor. And that's just the float tensor for the GPU. So if you cast, if you create a CUDA tensor uninitialized and fill it with uniform values, you can do exactly the same operations. So anything you can do on the CPU, you can do exactly the same on the GPU. So oftentimes, moving a whole code base from the CPU to the GPU is just a one-line change at the very beginning where you cast the types of the variables that you're operating on. Um, so that's uh, a quick view of the fundamentals of, of memory management in Torch. Um, and I'll talk at a very high level about kind of uh, the libraries and approaches that you might use when training neural networks in Torch. So the training cycle for training um, a model, specifically a neural network in Torch, usually load data from your hard drive uh, and then queue that up. And then you might have some piece of code that coordinates a neural network, a cost function at the end of that neural network, and then an optimizer which can take gradients uh, from that neural network and, and make updates to the parameters. Um, and in the Torch ecosystem, um, there's three packages that can kind of handle this for you. So threads, which I won't talk about. 
Uh, NN will handle the specification of your neural network and your cost function. Um, and Optim will handle the optimization of your neural network. Uh, so the NN package uh, handles specifying your neural network and your cost function and also calculating gradients. Um, so Hugo yesterday talked about two different ways you might think about phrasing a neural network. Uh, the first was writing a set of nested mathematical expressions, um, kind of writing things down symbolically. And then another way that he phrased uh, specifying a neural network was as a uh, connected graph of nodes, right? where each node is a function that's taking in edges, which are data. Uh, and so you can think of a neural network as a directed acyclic graph of computation. Uh, and NN really buys into this idea pretty heavily. So uh, it's really easy to build neural networks in NN by composing different building blocks on top of each other. So it's really like snapping Legos together. Um, so in this example, um, we start with a sequential container. So we'll have a container in which we can snap blocks inside of it. Uh, and then here we'll just define a convolutional neural network. So a lot of convolution and nonlinearity, uh, some pooling, some contrasted normalization, uh, and on and on in the network until the uh, kind of the log soft max at the end, right? So it's kind of a linear set of constructions for building a neural network. Um, and this is a sequential container, so we're just adding blocks one after the other, so the computation proceeds a little. Um, but we can also uh, compose uh, networks like Lego blocks and other types of configurations, so have parallel streams in a network, or uh, branch them out, or uh, concatenate them in. Uh, and so these are all uh, different types of containers you can play with. Um, and the NN package and what we care about when training neural networks are their gradients and their outputs. Uh, and the NN package exposes two main methods that you can call on the containers or also on the modules for pushing uh, activations through a network and then also for pulling the gradients from the loss uh, back to the parameters. And that the first is update output. So that will take output fed into a network and push it all the way through. And then update grad input is a call that you'll see which pulls the gradients all the way back. Uh, and sometimes you'll see at grad parameters, which actually updates the parameters with the gradients. Um, and uh, we also have a corresponding package for NN called QNN. So with QTorch, you just import QTorch, and then you have this new type. And with QNN, it's exactly the same thing, right? So every single layer that's been implemented in NN has a CUDA equivalent. So all you have to do is require QNN and then cast the model right there on line nine to the CUDA type, and then the whole network gets moved to the GPU, and the network runs on the GPU at that point. Right? So it's really just a one-line change uh, to move all of your computation to the GPU. Of course, you have to cast your input type as well to uh, CUDA tensor. So I've described like, building linear graphs of computation, but you might want to do something more complicated. Um, there's something called the NN graph package. So instead of clicking Lego blocks together, you'll instantiate a module and then wire it to some other module um, as long as it's acyclic. Uh, and this lets you build more complicated direct acyclic graphs of computation in your neural network. We don't really use this at Twitter. We use a package called Torch Autograd. That's because I think that explicitly building your compute graph can get a little cumbersome. We say, okay, give me this module and then wire it to this one. What's more natural, at least to me, is just to write down the code that you want implemented. Right? So just write in an imperative style, I want to take the 10H of this output, and then I want to take the output of that 10H and do something else with it. So I, I think code written in this imperative style is a lot more readable uh, and allows me to kind of iterate a lot faster. And so we use this Torch Autograd package that I'll talk a bit more about later to implement automatic differentiation on arbitrary compute graphs. Um, so I'll discuss that a bit more. I'll talk briefly about the Optin package um, without going into too much detail. Um, so the Optin package implements a whole host of first order optimization methods. Um, so including you know, our friend's stochastic gradient descent, which is always with us, um, and then some line search methods like LBFGS, and then some newer things like Atom and, and RMS prop. And Optim is, is a little, uh, kind of changes the way that you think about writing your code just a little bit. Um, so there on the bottom there, I've got that optim.sgd function, and it's got three input parameters. Um, I'll go kind of from right to left. So the config is like the learning rate and the momentum, the things that parameterize your optimization. And then x is the parameters of your neural network. And then the first uh, input is a function um, that takes in as an argument your parameters and then outputs the loss and the gradients. 
So you'll notice that nowhere here is data loading or the specification of the model. Uh, that all gets closed over by this function. So in that function, you need to load your data and you need to evaluate your neural network and grab the, and grab the gradients. Um, so it can be kind of a rearrangement of how you ordinarily think about writing this type of code. But once you have it written in this style, you can replace SGD with Atom, you know, with deleting three characters and adding four. Um, and so you can actually sometimes, it's so easy, you can treat uh, the optimizer as like a categorical variable to optimize as a hyperparameter, um, if that's something that you're interested in doing. Um, another uh, thing to think about when using the optim package is that it expects that all the parameters that you're trying to optimize are contiguous in memory. And this happens automatically when you're using torch NN. Um, so the weights and biases of layer one are right next to the weights and biases of layer two in the memory and the storage for that neural network. But if you're optimizing something that's not in NN, you'll have to kind of pack all of your parameters together and provide it to NN so, and to optim. Uh, so that's something just to, to kind of consider. Um, so NN and optim together are kind of like packages that take advantage of torch uh, on, build on the foundation of Torch to provide neural networks and the ability to optimize those neural networks on both the CPU or the GPU. And it's kind of a high level overview of, of, of like what's available and what the functionalities are. Um, so that's the first half um, of the talk or the first part of the talk. Um, and I'd like to switch to talk a bit more about this package Torch Autograd. Um, so, yeah. Uh, can you explain the functional relation of Optimus? Uh, what's uh, yeah, so you're, you're passing in a, a function here, and this function is spitting out the loss and the gradients, and so you have to close over the model. So the model has to be an up value that's declared outside of the function. Uh, so it's just a different style of writing. Instead of writing things in an object-oriented style, you're kind of using a, a closure style, which you can do the same thing in both styles. Is that, I don't know if that answers your question. Okay. Um, so just a show of hands, who has heard of automatic differentiation? Okay, everybody. Um, and has anybody heard of Autograd, the package before? Okay, so some folks, cool. Um, so Autograd is Twitter's, um, it's really an industrial strength, but extremely flexible implementation of automatic differentiation. Uh, and we try really crazy ideas in Autograd. So, in, you know, instead of writing uh, computation as a linear set of blocks, uh, you can really write anything down, any numeric function, and expect to be able to get the gradients of that function. Um, it was inspired by the original version in Python from Ryan Adams' group at, at Harvard. Um, and Dougal McLaurin, David Duvino, and Matt Johnson were the kind of original developers of the Python version. Um, so just taking kind of a, a, a step back uh, to appreciate the, before I get into automatic differentiation, to appreciate the stable abstractions that all of machine learning is built on. Um, so we don't really think about arrays anymore. You know, that was kind of solved in the late 50s. Uh, we don't really think about how to call linear algebra routines. That was solved by LAPAC. And we kind of take for granted the idea that we shouldn't really be programming, doing scientific computing, unless we have all of the kind of primitive functions that we would want. Like, I'm not going to re-implement my own exponential. I'm not going to re-implement sampling from a, you know, a normal distribution. Um, kind of take advantage that, that all should just be there. And MATLAB and NumPy kind of gave us that expectation. And we really should take these abstractions for granted in order for us to stay sane. Like we don't want to go back down to the networking stack and re-implement re re everything by hand. Uh, we really should kind of build on top of these really strong abstractions. But machine learning has, has other abstractions that I think are still kind of nascent um, that I'm really interested to see how they, be, how they kind of uh, evolve and solidify. Um, and I would say that automatic differentiation really is the abstraction for gradient-based machine learning. Um, so what is automatic differentiation? Uh, it's a process that mechanically calculates derivatives as functions expressed as computer programs at machine precision and with complexity guarantees. So there's like three parts to that statement. The first is that autodiff or just AD um, should take in as an input a program you can run that will give you a number output and it should output a new program that will give you the gradient as well as the original output. Right? So it's a transformation of a program you can run. Um, and it has machine precision, so automatic differentiation guarantees that uh, your new function that calculates gradients will have the same numerical stability as the original function. Right? And also it has complexity guarantees. So there'll just be some constant factor, so some 
uh, it'll be at most three times the complexity of the original function. Um, and this distinguishes it from finite differences. So there was a question in Hugo's talk about, well, why can't you just train neural networks using finite differences? Um, uh, apparently, people actually did this in the 60s. Um, so there's this book called Talking Nets in an interview with um, Widrow, which is one of the chapters. It's a book of like interviews with people that were luminaries in neural networks. It's a great book if you, if you haven't read it. Uh, Widrow describes uh, actually training neural networks with uh, finite differences and kind of the pain and difficulty of having to train neural networks in that fashion uh, because they're incredibly numerically stable to do that. The process of finite differences means perturbing your input a little bit and then passing it through a whole composure of a bunch of functions which increases the numerical instability so kind of exacerbates the problem. It's also very inefficient. It's not symbolic differentiation. So it's not something that you would like type in a mathematical expression to Mathematica and say, give me the partial derivative of this expression. Um, there's no complexity guarantee with that. So for highly nested functions, which is every neural net, um, the size of the expression you get back from naive symbolic differentiation can swell very, very quickly. Right? And that's not the case with automatic differentiation. Um, so this idea has been rediscovered several times. Um, there's a, a kind of a review uh, paper there. The first implementation um, that I'm aware of where the input to Autodiff is a program and the output is a program is this guy Bert Spielpending's thesis in 1980. He wrote this thesis that described Autodiff in perfect clarity and then just disappeared for like 30 years uh, and then kind of gave a talk at some Autodiff conference at some other point. So he's just disappeared from the field. Um, there was an earlier implementation of a, a variant called forward mode that I'll describe um, about 15 years earlier. Um, and it was, I guess, popularized in connectionist machine learning um, as back propagation by, by Rommel Hart, although there's some debate as to you know, who came first and who's responsible for the invention of this algorithm. But one thing to note is that in other fields like nuclear science and atmospheric sciences like meteorology and uh, computational fluid dynamics, um, these guys use AD all the time, and in fact, their tools for, doing, for using AD are actually a lot more sophisticated than the ones that we have in machine learning. Uh, so I think we actually have a lot to import and to learn from these different fields that have been happily you know, humming along and using AD to, to tune their models, um, to train their models. And also, I would make a distinction that we don't use AD, we use reverse mode AD. So there's, there's um, two main modes of automatic differentiation, two ways of calculating derivatives. Um, or two extreme variants. Uh, the first is called forward mode, which you'll almost never see in machine learning because it's a really bad idea, and I'll explain why it's a bad idea in machine learning. Uh, and then reverse mode, which is synonymous with backpropagation. Uh, and these are really just different orders of applying the chain rule. So um, here's like a, a symbolic view of forward mode automatic differentiation. So say we've got a neural network that takes in an image and predicts the probabilities of classes. Um, that's a composition of functions, and so we have this uh, chain of partial derivatives uh, that we want to um, uh, calculate the derivative of the loss with respect to the parameters. And so we need to apply the chain rule to those partial derivatives. In the forward mode, in, in with this, we can apply the chain rule in any direction that we like, right? So we can start uh, from the left and go to the right. You can kind of see immediately that that's a bad idea because you have these big matrix matrix multiplies. Um, so going left to right uh, is a bad idea. Uh, especially when, or it is a bad idea when you're going from many parameters to a scalar loss, right? Um, it's actually a good idea when you're going from a small set of parameters to a lot of numbers, right? And that's the case when you want like vector flow fields or something like that. But you never do that in optimization because the output is always some scalar loss. We can view this in a different way as, as a, in like a program view. So here's a program we want to differentiate. So we have f of a, b, and c. If b is greater than c, then return a times the sine of b. Otherwise, return a plus b times c. Um, so we can backpropagate through this. Um, there's an if statement, but we can actually kind of ignore it. Um, and the way we can ignore it is by just uh, recording the trace of the operations that were actually run by the program. And this is called a Wengert list. So we first assign a to uh, 3 to a, and um, 2 to b, and then 1 to c. And then we basically erase the if statement because that's not an, it's not a numerical function. And we return uh, uh, a times the sine of b. Right? So this is a trace of this program, you know, a run through this program. And if we wanted to do the forward mode of backpropagation uh, with this program, we would uh, 
define A as 3, and then we'd instantiate the derivative of A with respect to A. So we're starting the chain rule from the left, right? And B, uh, 2 is B, and then the derivative of B with respect to A is 0, and C is 1, and then the derivative of C with respect to A is 0. And then we'll run D, and then we'll get the derivative of D with respect to A, because we have all the information at that point. So this is a really, really simple example. Um, but I think you can appreciate that if you wanted to get the derivative of D with respect to B, you'd have to do a whole other sweep through this program. Or you'd have to initialize um, derivative of B with respect to uh, B as, uh, as 1. Um, this is really bad for neural networks. So if you have a million parameters, that means you have to do a million sweeps of forward mode automatic differentiation in order to get the gradients that you need to make an update. So this is a really bad idea. However, if you had some other function of A, B, and C that you wanted uh, to calculate partial derivatives for, at the very end of this evaluation, you have that all available to you. Right? So if you have fan out in your computation graph, so if you go from very few parameters to very many, forward mode's a good idea. That's just not something that happens in machine learning a lot. Um, and so reverse mode uh, is the same idea, except we're evaluating the chain rule from right to left. So we've got these nice matrix vector products that keep things small. Um, much better complexity when you have a scalar valued output. And we can build a Wengert list for the same function using reverse mode. So since we're going from right to left, we actually need all of the, um, we need the whole trace to be available before we can start calculating uh, the gradients. So we'll define A, B, and C, and D, and that's our, our trace of this program. Um, and then when we want to calculate the derivatives or do back propagation, we'll actually run the whole program and then start the derivative of D with respect to D as one, and then build up our gradient from the right side of the chain rule all the way to the left. So we actually need to tape the whole program. We need a record of the whole program before we can do back propagation. Right? And then we can return the gradients there. I think you can appreciate here, if we want the gradients of D with respect to B, that's just an extra single step here. Whereas before, we have to go through the whole program again. And as your program becomes larger and more complicated, this becomes a more severe penalty in forward mode, but definitely not in reverse mode. All right, so that's kind of the, the, the differences between forward mode and reverse mode, and why you really never see forward mode in uh, machine learning, and why you see reverse mode, and, um, and that's backpropagation. So auto, uh, Torch Autograd is an implementation of reverse mode autodiff. Um, and so this is an entire function for training a three-layer MLP in Torch Autograd. Um, so we'll define the parameters at the top, define our neural network as um, you know, non-linearities uh, interspersed between matrix multiplies and additions, uh, and then a loss function at the end. Um, and then this is really the entirety of the API of Autograd. Right? So you import Autograd, and then you call grad on the function you would like the gradients of, and it gives you back a new function. And then down at line 24, we'll actually call that new function, and instead of returning the loss, it'll return the gradients of the loss with respect to the parameters. So we've just transformed this function into a function that will now give us the gradients for free, so we don't have to really worry about uh, writing down any partial derivatives or doing any math. So as long as um, your function is differentiable, uh, Autograd will give you back the gradients of that function. So what's actually happening uh, under the scenes uh, is as this function is running, like I said before, we're actually keeping track of the whole tape. Um, so on the first line, we're doing a matrix multiply. And so we're going to save w and input uh, and the function, as well as the output. And then when we add uh, h1 and params.b to make h2, uh, we will save all that information as well. So we're saving the results of this compute graph kind of behind the scenes while you're running uh, this numeric function. And the way we do this is via operator overloading. So um, for every function in Torch, we're going to overload that function with one that keeps track of computation, builds up a linked list of computation. So we'll save the original function, and then in our new re re redefinition of torch.sum, uh, we'll check if there's a special type being passed to the function, and if not, we'll just return the original function. Uh, and if not, uh, if there is a special type, then we'll unpack that type, grab the output value, and then pack it back into the special type. And this special type keeps track of the function that was run, the arguments that were passed to that function, and then the outputs. Because um, really that's all you need along with the gradient that's coming in to calculate um, uh, the partial derivatives at that particular step. So we keep track of this compute graph, 
And then when we need to evaluate the partial derivatives, we have access to all of the local information we'd need to calculate that gradient to pass it back down the compute function. Um, and what's actually happening when we uh, calculate gradients back down the compute graph is we're looking up in a big, big table all of the partial derivatives for every torch function that is available. So we've written all these partial derivatives by hand so that you can compose them together in really any way that you please. Right, so if we hit uh, a square root function in this compute graph, we just go look up the gradient of the first argument of square root. It's only one argument. And then we can use that to calculate the gradient and then propagate it through the graph. Right, so behind the scenes, we've done all this work to have you know, individual partial derivatives. And then uh, by using the chain rule in reverse mode autodiff, we can actually calculate the gradients through an entire function that's been composed together. Yeah. Uh, so usually when we use keep learning, we back up to the entire network, right? Unless mm -hmm. you are uh, fine tuning, so you have frozen this and frozen some of the mm -hmm. So uh, in autograd, if, if I want to back up to the entire network, I will have to use the uh, gradient function for each of the functions. Like for each of the components. So is, is there some way where I can just call one function and it will automatically compute gradients through the entire network? Yep. That's, that's, that is the grad function. So uh, I'll show you in a little bit, but we've exposed uh, the ability to use NN modules. So if you have a network that you've written in NN, Torch NN, you can wrap that and use that in Autograd. And then you can combine networks however you want. So you could plug a CNN into an LSTM and do image captioning. And Autograd will just figure out how to calculate the derivatives through all of that. So you can compose anything, and Autograd will take care of uh, calculating the derivatives through those functions. Because in your previous slides, mm -hmm. you were calling the function on loss. That was the last part of the network. So I thought you have to call that for every part of the network. Um, loss, actually, let me show you that again. Whoops. So uh, loss is actually calling into the neural network function. So when we go into that function and, and call neural network, which is defined up there, we're actually taping the contents of that function as well. So we're keeping track of everything that's run and all the functions that are kind of recursively called. Do, 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 do. Um, so uh, I'll just show you a couple examples kind of increasing in complexity of what you can do with Autograd. So of course we can back propagate through really basic arithmetic. You just write that down you know, uh, like you would using normal torch code, you can get the gradients of that uh, arithmetic expression. Um, like I mentioned before, you can have control flow. So you can just have an if statement there, uh, not have to worry about phrasing it as a cond or doing anything uh, really complicated like you'd have to do in, in maybe Theano or TensorFlow. You can just write plain code, and Autograd will figure out the derivatives of this code for you. Um, and I've been using scalars, but of course, this all works with tensors, right? So Weight, you know, the weights of a neural network are matrices and everything is, it works for matrices as well as scalars. Um, so I, I think Autograd really shines when you start to use more complicated control flow. So a for loop, for instance, is trivial in Autograd. Right? You just write a for loop and uh, we'll take the gradients with, you know, all the way through that for loop. Extra rephrasing of your computation you have to do. There's no restrictions. Uh, this could be a nested for loop. You could nest it five times. It doesn't matter. Autograd will figure out the, the gradients. Um, so one thing that I actually don't think is possible in any other uh, automatic differentiation package is the ability to uh, call yourself recursively or to have uh, recursive uh, control flow. So this actually implements the same thing as the previous for loop. So here I'm just multiplying a by itself and storing that as a, and I'm going to do that b times. Um, here I have a function where if b is 0, return a. Otherwise, take the f of a times a and decrement b. So it does the same thing. It just uses a recursive uh, calling style. But I'm calling f inside of f, right? So I have this recursive uh, function. But Autograd has no problem with that. So you can take gradients through recursive functions. And you could you know, compose all these things together and have if statements, for loops, recursive function calls. And the gradients will just be figured out for you. You don't really have to worry about uh, the specifics there. So it allows you to really naturally phrase uh, your computation. Um, one thing that's uh, I think a little bit neat is adding your own gradients or playing with the gradients is actually pretty easy to do in Autograd. So why would you want to do that? Uh, gradient clipping, for instance, you might want to have a function that on the forward pass is the identity function, but on the backwards pass is a clamp. Make sure that your gradients don't grow too much. So you can easily make a function 
uh, in Autograd that has a partial derivative that doesn't look like the actual partial derivative of the forward pass. It's pretty easy. So in this example, um, I'm taking the sum of the floor of a to the third. And floor is a rounding operation, so its gradient is 0 almost everywhere. Um, and the gradients passing through this function are correctly 0. right? So this is bottleneck that's crushing the gradient. Maybe I want to backpropagate through floor. Like, for instance, the JPEG compression algorithm has a, a quantization step. And maybe I want to take the gradients of the JPEG compression algorithm, because you know, I'm interested in doing that, for instance. Um, so I can make the gradient of floor disappear really easily. So I'll require autograd. I'll make my own special module. And I'll add a floor method to my special module. And internally, floor is just calling torch.floor, like before. And then I'll overload my module that I call special. And I'll define the gradient of floor inside that module. And I'll have the gradient just return g. So just pass through the gradient as if floor doesn't exist. And then I can call uh, this original function and actually have gradients pass through that. So it's really trivial to play with the kind of internals and the mechanisms of automatic differentiation in, in Autograd. So you can kind of imagine crazy ideas and just implement them very, very quickly. Um, so those are a couple examples of, of using Autograd um, and kind of the, some of the more exotic features that differentiate it from, from the alternatives. So what is actually differentiating these different neural network libraries, or what's one axis along which all of these different libraries are, are separate? Uh, one way I like to think about it is the granularity at which they implement autodiff. Right, so something like scikit-learn, you get a whole model, and you actually can't even compose them. Right? So you have a whole model, and that's it. With something like TorchNN, you get these big layers, and you can compose the layers like you know, Lego blocks, um, but you have no access to the operations that are inside those Lego blocks. Um, and uh, what I would call full automatic differentiation, which is implemented by Autograd and Theano and TensorFlow, uh, you can use really any operation in a host language. In Autograd, that host language happens to be Torch. Uh, and in Theano and TensorFlow, that host language is a language inside of Python, uh, which I think is a distinction that uh, needs to be made. Um, and practically, this uh, level of granularity is enforced by what partial derivatives the developers happen to expose to you. Right? So you get layers, and you can only compose layers because those are the partial derivatives that the uh, developers of those libraries have exposed to you in order for you to compose them together uh, to use an automatic differentiation. But Sometimes people spend a lot of time implementing a very efficient layer, like a convolution on the GPU that engineers at NVIDIA or Nervada Systems have spent a long time making really, really fast, and you want to use that layer. But you have some weird loss function, and there is no fast implementation of that, but you just need a correct implementation. So perhaps you want to compose these different styles together. Right? So we actually don't want any limits on, how, on what style we need to use. And we can actually uh, write neural networks in an arbitrary style uh, in Autograd. So here's the kind of three different styles of writing uh, a three-layer, multi-layer perceptron um, using kind of full autodiff. So this is the most granular level where we're, we're defining all of the uh, uh, parameters ahead of time. And then we're using torch functions to do the matrix multiplications and the tan h's and the, and, uh, and the loss function. Um, but we can also pop one level up. And this kind of gets at your question, which is, in Autograd, we have this sub-module called NN. So it's like autograd.nn. And inside of that module are every single NN module that's normally exposed in Torch NN. So you can use everything that has been implemented kind of prior. There's a ton of work that's gone into that. And so you can use a functionalized version of all these modules where uh, you might instantiate, for instance, um, you know, nn.linear. And you get back a function which implements the linear layer and the parameters for that linear layer. Right? And so you just build up your whole network here. And then you can call these functions where the first argument are the parameters and the second are the inputs. And you can compose these as big layers here. So you can use CUDI and convolutions here, uh, along with whatever arbitrary torch code uh, you please. Um, and also, sometimes you just want a neural network, or sometimes you just want a convnet. Uh, and in Autograd, we have a module sub -mod a model submodule uh, where you can just grab entire networks. Right? So if you want to compose a CNN with an LSTM, or uh, you know, build a generative uh, adversarial network and compose two networks together that way. Uh, it's very easy to grab the whole network and then compose them together. Um, so that's kind of the high level. That's like some a tour a tour through Torch Autograd. Um, and at Twitter, practically, uh, this has allowed us to kind of prototype without fear. Uh, 
so we can dive into really weird ideas without worrying about getting bogged down in the details. Um, so you can imagine some crazy loss function and just write it down in plain code and then expect to get the gradients correct the first time. Um, and what that means practically is we do try crazier, potentially high payoff ideas more often because it's kind of free to get the gradients. We don't have to worry about doing that context switch where you go from programming mode to math mode, uh, which can actually kind of be painful, at least for me sometimes. Um, and also, once you're done training your network, Autograd just completely disappears. It's just regular numeric code at that point uh, that you can just run just as fast as, you know, as if Autograd didn't exist. Um, we've used Autograd to train very large models that run on a lot of media that's uploaded to Twitter. Um, and then in terms of like the speed penalty, which is uh, probably one of the main criticisms of Autograd, it's usually fast enough. We do have an optimized mode that's uh, essentially as fast as using regular NN, um, but it has some caveats that I can get into if you're interested in that. Um, and that's effectively nearly uh, a compiler uh, that's kind of happening at runtime. So it's a just-in-time compiler for neural networks. Um, so you know, Autograd has allowed us to really try new stuff a lot faster. Um, and we, it's one of the first tools that we reach for. But there's a lot of other autodiff ideas that haven't made their way from nuclear science and atmospheric science and computational field dynamics into machine learning. And there's a lot of really cool ideas that could accelerate the pace of development, but also the speed at which networks are trained. Um, so here's a couple ideas that I think would be interesting to look into. Uh, the first is checkpointing, and this has actually been implemented, I think, only by MXNet at this point. Um, and the idea here is you don't actually need to save all the intermediate computation uh, in order to backpropagate. Uh, you might actually delete or not save some of your intermediate results and then recompute them as you need them. And this can save you a ton of memory. Uh, so if you just decide to save you know, every 10th layer, for instance, in a ResNet, and recompute 10 layers at a time when you're doing your backwards pass, you pay in computation, but you can save enormously in memory. Uh, it turns out to be a little tricky to implement this well, and solving this like, fully is an NP-hard problem, but there's good heuristics uh, for, for checkpointing schedules. Um, also potentially is faster. For instance, you can throw away the intermediate results from like nonlinearities or pointwise functions because you can fuse those operations in CUDA. And so it might be actually cheaper to just do the computation again than load all that uh, from memory onto the registers that you're, you're doing your computation with. Um, another idea is, is mixing forward mode and reverse mode. So I mentioned forward mode's really bad. Forward mode is really bad uh, for doing your entire network because you start with many parameters and you end up with one scalar loss. But in the middle, your graph could be any shape. So if your graph starts from something small and blows up something very large, so if you're generating an image, for instance, and then you're coming down to a scalar loss, you have this diamond-shaped network. You might imagine actually doing reverse mode into the, the explosion point and then doing forward mode up until that point and kind of merging the results. So you don't have to just do forward mode or reverse mode. You can mix the two. There's a name for it. It's called cross-country elimination. Again, it's tricky to implement, but there is potentially giant speedups that are available using technology that just hasn't made it into machine learning at this point. Um, and stencils I won't talk too much about, but you, know, you can phrase every element-wise computation as a stencil, um, which is like a, a convolution or a blur. You, you can talk about those as stencils. Implementing gradients for those efficiently and automatically is tough. Uh, and some people in computer graphics do work on this. Um, so um, Brian Gunter and, and Zach DeVito uh, have some work on this that's, I think, pretty compelling. It could result in big speedups. Um, Source-to-source -source compilation, I think, is also a very interesting idea. So what I've described to you is what's called a tape-based reverse mode automatic differentiation, where we're recording the computation that occurs at runtime and then reversing that computation to get the gradients at runtime. You could imagine, however, looking at the whole source code and then printing out the gradients for that source code next to it, concatenating them, and then returning a new string of a function, and then having that be your gradient. So that's called source-to-source -source transformation. That's the original way that Autodiff was implemented, you know, back in the 80s in Fortran. Uh, and people haven't really uh, done this a lot lately because operator overloading is a whole lot easier than building like a lexer and a parser and a compiler. Um, so reverse mode with a tape is just easier to implement. Um, however, it is the gold standard for performance in these other fields that make use of automatic differentiation a lot. So I think we're actually missing out on potentially a really fast technique for doing auto diff. Um, the challenge there is how do you reverse an if statement? How do you reverse a for loop? These are challenges that kind of have to just be tackled. Um, and then also higher order gradients. So if you want the Hessian, 
uh, you might want to phrase that as taking the grad of the grad of f. And indeed, this works in Python autograd and, in, and with some caveats in Torch autograd. Uh, but there's really not that many efficient implementations. So I think that exploration with second order methods or habitual explanation of, sec of uh, exploration of second order methods would really expand if it was a lot easier to get Hessian vector products. Right now, it's just a pain. You just have to spend a lot of time thinking about that. There's not many efficient implementations of this. Um, but there are libraries that will do this for you, period. But I think there's room in making this something that's really fast that you w actually want to reach for and, like, and try to experiment with. Um, and it's actually really easy to get started with all this stuff. Um, Anaconda is kind of the de facto distribution for scientific Python. Uh, and all of this is now installable in Anaconda. So if you have Anaconda installed, it's a one-liner there on line 9 to get all these packages and start playing with it. Um, so um, that's all the material that I have.